Hello, Family Partnership parents. I'm here again today with a parent workshop about learning spaces. And I'm very excited because I don't know if like you, I really love to peek into people's homes. I like to see how people are doing homeschool. All of us are so diverse. We have different families. We have different kids. We have different homes. So it's really, really exciting today to introduce you to three moms. It's going to be Erica, Don, and Megan. They're going to show us their homeschooling spaces. They're going to talk to us about what a day looks like in their home. And then you get to ask them questions. So thank you, ladies, for being here. And we're going to start with Erica. So Erica, tell us about your family and show us your space. All right. Um, I'm Erica. I have four children. They are first grade, third grade, fifth grade, and seventh grade this year. We've been homeschooling since my oldest was in kindergarten, so we have quite the collection of stuff at this point. You guys are going to get a whole house tour today, just about, because we use all of it. Um, so I'll start. We'll start here. This is my house. I tidied it up for you guys a little bit. Um, down that hallway is master bedroom and bathroom. That zone is off limits for school, other than the occasional, you know, spelling test or quiet stuff that happens back there. But so that is it. That's what the house looks like. This hallway up here has got a whiteboard and a chalkboard. You can tell they're from when my kids were shorter because they're way down low. This hallway up here has got, I think it's supposed to be a coat closet or utility closet and it's got all my junk in it, but it also has all of my extra curriculum in several layers, um, large games and things that I couldn't fit anywhere else. Stuff we're not using now, but you know, when you have four children, someone's using it shortly. Um, so when you come in here, let's see, this is the kitchen area. Um, this is the obvious space for school where a lot of our stuff gets done. This is my first grader and he's working on his things at the table. That's his zone. That whiteboard over on the back door there sticks up with magnets so it can come down. We've got a display of some of the things we've been working on and helping us remember. This cabinet has got all of the things that we use regularly, um, either together or some of the kids individually and craft supplies in all the drawers. Let's see. This closet also has some school supplies and games. Some of these things are a holdover from when I had preschoolers and we had a little, we were a little heavier on the games. This is one kid bedroom. Let's see what's going on in here. It's Lego time. Hi there. Um, this is my boys' room. All the books on the shelf are, I mean, there's to read, but they are also school related. So some of the school stuff gets stashed in here. Um, this closet, this looks crazy, but there's games and things in here. And when those when I had preschoolers, those little bins each contained preschool activities that could be brought to the table, um, but not kept necessarily where they could reach them. Um, so that was, like I said, t these days there's Legos in those boxes, but this is the older girls room. Knock, knock ladies. Uh -huh. This is their school zone. Turn some lights on. They've got a double desk in here. Again, all as many books and art and craft supplies as we could fit in to this space. Um, but having their room and a door to close sometimes helps when there are other people who have questions. Um, a lot of the rest of school happens down here in the living room. There's a sewing desk in that corner that one of uh, um, that child number three often uses for his schoolwork. And, and a lot of the rest of the school books are stashed out here on the shelves. I've got a system going where the books all have color-coded stickers that help 
um, help me keep track of what goes with what topic, because when kids take them from all over the house, they end up here, there, and everywhere. It's really nice to know where they are supposed to go back again. Um, I think that pretty well covers. Katrina, do you have anything else that you wanted to see today? I love seeing your whole house. Thank you for inviting us in. You didn't tidy up a little. It's super clean. If I showed you my whole house, it'd be a disaster. So thank you so much. But I would love to know what a typical day looks like in your house. So from the time you guys get up until, you know, until you're done with school. Okay. Um, a typical day is, well, oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's hard to say. I would say three days a week or so we are here at home more or less for the bulk of the day. Um, we may go somewhere later in the afternoon um, or evening for activities, but about three days a week, we'll get up and um, the kids kind of have two separate sections of work. Hey, Kurt, get me your independent work paper. They kind of have two separate sections of work. There's work we do together, and then there's work that they do independently. And some mornings, they'll just get started right on that independent work as soon as they are up and going. Uh, and then we will do breakfast. Can I have that? Thank you. And then we will do breakfast, and we will clean up the house a little bit. Um, take care of chores and laundry and stuff like that. And then we will sit down at that kitchen table that I showed you and typically go through, I think some people would call it like a morning basket um, of a few topics that we're gonna do together. Um, it changes, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's memory work, sometimes it's grammar, um, sometimes it's not. <laughs> um, uh, and we will spend probably an hour or so sitting at the table working on all that stuff. Um, been doing science with all three of the younger kids at that point. And then I will turn them loose and say, you all go work. Everybody gets one of these that has their assignments on it for the week that I make up on a Sunday night. Um, and then they can go do that. I mean, it's not totally independent, but it's all the topics like math and spelling and reading that they're not all working at the same grade level. So they have their own assignments. They know what they're supposed to do. They come find me when they need help, but otherwise they're, um, and they need help. Like, you know, we'll spend another hour or two working through those depending on how motivated we're feeling um, on a given day. And, and then again, probably three days a week or so, do we make time to sit back down in the living room and do something um, whether it's a read aloud or a picture book or working on a different topic together like history, um, a little bit more time. We try to finish up about this time of day. Some days it's way later. And uh, I will look at it when I'm done. <laughs> and uh, some days it's way later and some days it's a little earlier depending on what we have going on. Um, sometimes that time at the table that seems so really wonderful um, ends up getting scrapped because we have something else to do that day. And so it ends up being bare minimum of, you know, the math and language arts stuff that we've sort of scheduled. Um, there's typically one day a week where we're out of the house entirely. So that one is completely different. So that's all super, super helpful. I'm gonna see if anyone has any questions. I have a question, so if nobody has one, I'll ask. But um, do you guys have any questions for Erica about her day or about her space or how she's organized it? I don't have a question, but I have two comments, two things that I want to steal. First, it's really helpful to see the flow of somebody's day with kids that are older, because my kids are still in a very hands-on stage and I'm excited to be thinking about and planning toward that time where I do divide out into the group and the independent work. So I loved that little sheet that you had and I'm excited for in a couple years when I'm ready to do that with my kids. Also the dot system on your books. Yeah, I'm like going to do this afternoon. I love that. I'm really excited. You can, you can order the rectangular labels from Amazon and you can get like a multi-pack of colors and then a few more of others. 
Uh, see, you could see it, but they're on all the books in the bedrooms and stuff too, because then when everybody pulls out, you know, all these books, which you want them to do, of course, right? You want yeah, them to pull them out and read them. But then, you know, I'm trying to pull it out and say like, where's my US history books? I know they're here somewhere, all these reading books for the little kids, but you know, they're scattered here, there and everywhere. Yeah. So. yeah. I have lovingly organized our books. I don't know how many times and they're just gone and I want them to be gone, but also I don't. So that dot system seems like a really great way for me to breathe through it and for me to salvage it. So thank you for that. Well, then I'll ask my question. So Erica, what do you do if your kids don't do their independent work? If they don't finish it that day, what happens? They finish it. <laughs> um, they, they, sometimes, um, sometimes there are extenuating circumstances. And actually I have, sometimes I have the opposite problem. I have a couple of children who are like, mama, we have got to get it done. It's on our paper and it has to happen. And I tell them I made the paper and I'm the one who decided we were doing this other thing instead. So it's going to be okay. Um, occasionally we have worked on Saturday to finish up a few things that didn't get done. Um, occasionally I've just said, I'm sorry, you're not going to make it, you know, like you're not going to be able to do Friday's work this week because we had other things come up. Um, mostly they are motivated to work on it because, um, I, I think because it's, you know, it's, it's not easy stuff, but it's like, okay, we've all checked it off and we're all happy to check off those boxes. Um, and it's kind of their own domain. So they, they usually take care of it. Don't tell them that there's that option. That they <laughs> well, I'm only asking because one year I had a kid who I didn't check on every single day and I realized, you know, a month in they'd done nothing. So, um, you know. I do look over their books and stuff on Sunday night when I assign the next week's worth of things and say, are you doing your work? Are you doing it like, like is there some semblance of accuracy happening on your work um, to make sure that things aren't falling through the cracks? Because we have we've had that too, where, you know, oh, you've done it, but you haven't done it correctly at all. So, yeah. And I think we all, I mean, all my kids have done something along those lines, pushing the boundaries. Um, and then it looked like to me, their independent work was handwriting, spelling, um, some kind of language arts and math. And then, so I'm guessing together you do social studies, science, music, art, those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And what each kid has for independent work kind of varies on their age. Like now I have a seventh grader, she's doing her own science curriculum. The rest of us are not um, doing it with her. But, you know, by the time you're 13, you can, you can manage to read your book and do your work and come to me with questions. So it works out pretty well. Okay, any more questions for Erica before she goes and helps her adorable children with whatever they need? I just wanted to say, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm on my iPad. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't used Zoom on it. Um, I just wanted to say um, to Megan and to Erica, if you and all of you, obviously, if you didn't know, but I found a fabulous resource for um, keeping track of your books. That's free. And it's L-I-B-I-B. -I -I and it has an app on your phone. And you so you can just scan the barcodes right from your phone. You can set up different libraries. So I set up one that has like, we have a display bookshelf, like the wooden ones, you know, that has the slots in it or whatever. So I did a library called Looking Books. And then I did a library called Paperbacks. And then I did science, geography, and so forth. Um, but they also have it where you can log in online. So for those books that don't scan or that have... Um, like just the words on the back, like this one doesn't have a barcode, but it has the ISBN number. So you can just 10 key it on, uh, on your computer. Like you can just get online and do it. Um, that's been really helpful to like know the location since I sorted the libraries like that. And also I can't remember, like, do I have that book yet? Like, cause I go to like Bishop's Attic and by Village and Goodwill and all the things. And I'm like, do I have this? Like, I don't even know. <laughs> like I have, um, I think we're close to 400 and something that I have scanned in. So I can't remember everything, you know? So I just wanted to share that resource. I've used a couple of other ones, but this one, having it on the computer 
you can see all the covers and everything. So when you're like doing a unit study plan, like you can scroll through it and like actually remember what the book looks like um, that you're looking for. So I'm just um, saying that. And I don't know how old um, your kids are, Megan, but my daughter is six in first grade and she does independent work. And she had, I do it like this. It was on Canva and it was already made and she has her independent work as well. Like, um, I think that's good for them to practice that. Like Erica said, they, they do it. There's no discussion. Like, wow, Christina, you've got some organizational goals going on over there. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and toot my own horn here because I just started my uh, homeschool YouTube channel. Um, it's called Alaskan Schoolhouse, and um, I just started it, and I also have my 24 plan, which Alaskan Schoolhouse is actually falling under it, but anyways, um, my 24 plan is all about paper planning. This is my planner, um, and so that's kind of, um, I just wanted to share it because, you know, homeschooling is kind of taking over my life, so <laughs> might as well, and you guys like talking about homeschool stuff, so might as well. Oh, how fun, Christina. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that. I love the ideas. And Erica, thank you so much for taking time to show us your home and to show us You're welcome. Um, your books and your organization. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm inspired. So I am going to say goodbye to Erica because I know you have kids. Hey, guys. Yep. And I'm going to introduce you guys to the next mama. Her name's Dawn. So Dawn, tell us about your kids and show us your space. Hi, my name is Dawn. And I'm really enjoying listening to everyone's ideas so far. I've been taking some notes. So um, I have two kiddos, uh, Maddie, who is 12 and in seventh grade, and Everett, who is nine in third grade. And um, we've been homeschooling for two years. Um, they were in a traditional school, Eagle Academy, before this, which was a pretty um, structured environment and a very good school. And um, so when we switched to homeschooling, um, I was inspired by other moms, homeschool rooms, and I decided to actually, we had this extra room in our house. It's very small, but we really weren't doing anything with it. So I decided to make a separate room to homeschool in. Um, and it's been, it's worked really well for us. Um, do we do all of our schooling in this room? No, we do quite a bit still at the kitchen table. Uh, a lot of our art happens down there. Um, science typically happens in the kitchen. We do a lot of outdoor activities, of course, as well. Uh, we do field trips, um, you know, outside. So, um, but our day-to-day, -day, Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday, um, happens in this room. So I'll show you a little bit of the room and I'm gonna pick up my iPad here. So we'll start this wall here. So this is the one wall I'm gonna, I'm basically as far back as I can get. Um, we have a whiteboard um, and I put up letters around the room because my son is in third grade and still working on his curse of practice. So that's helpful. Um, the posters I got, um, I got from Amazon and um, they've been helpful too. We look at them, we talk about them, especially Everett, my third grader. Um, a lot of this is maybe a little bit more simplistic than my seventh grader needs, but um, I still think it's fun to have on the walls. And then this is next to Everett's desk and the periodic, periodic table is next to Maddie's desk. Um, so I'll skip back again. They do each have their own desk. Um, they are in, you know, their grades are quite different. So I do have them do their independent work at these desks. Um, we start typically around nine in the morning and um, do our um, main, main subjects in here. So um, we start with math, do an hour, language arts, an hour, and then we do social studies or science for an hour. And so they typically sit at these desks for those subjects. Um, as Everett was learning his multiplication tables, we put these up. When he mastered them, I let him hang these numbers on the wall, just fun things to do. Um, they each have their own cork board for things that they're working on um, or special things that they wanna hang up. So this is the back of the room. Um, so let's see, one of the things I like here is the, just the, <laughs> the string with the uh, clothespins on it um, for projects and things that they're proud of, artwork, 
um, assignments that they did well on. So that's an easy, fun thing to display um, their work. Um, we have two small bookshelves here. Um, these are these don't have all of our uh, books and curriculum on it. It was a little overwhelming to have it all in here. So I have a closet also with all the extra stuff for the year, but I bring in the units that they're using right now and the books for them. Um, so that way I also keep everything else organized and then they can keep their things organized here. So the stuff that they're using, they have this little bin at the end and that's where they pull out of most, most of the time. And then the other books are references that we're using. Um, this is something that I've really liked is a little bin to turn in their homework. And um, I just like it because then they have that independence to finish an assignment and turn it in without um, coming to me. And then I grade that once a week and hand it back. Um, paper. Uh, this is the math manipulatives and science uh, box. I also have my own desk. I think it's important to have your own space to organize things and plan and keep track of things. Let's see. Um, motivations for setting up my space um, like this. I think for me, um, coming from a more structured environment, I wanted a, a structured environment for my kids, um, a room where they could, um, when we come into this room at nine in the morning, the expectations that we're gonna put on our learning caps and be in here for three hours together, um, learning, not only for them, but for me too, so that I'm um, able to put away the distractions of my household and my job and, and all the things. And when I come in here, I'm pretty focused on uh, their education. I, and they're also focused on their education. So it's expectations for them and for myself. Um, uh, what else can I say about that? Um, Tell us the jars, Don. You, you had some jars with little pieces of paper. What exactly is that? Okay, so the jars, this is really fun. And um, I'll show you this. So, so the jars, I'll start with these ones. So this jar here is the journal prompt jar. So um, several times a week, I'll have them come over here and they pick out a prompt for the journal and then they grab their journal and they write in it. So let me show you Maddie's journal. So, there's Maddie's journal and they put the prompt in there and then they write about their prompt, a free write. So that's one jar. And then the other jar, this jar is a PE jar. So in between subjects, if they need to get their wiggles out, they'll I'll let them draw this jar. And then they usually do um, 10 reps of the exercise. So that's been really fun. We just started that let's see this year. And then this jar is a jar with an activity to do at the end of the school day, if they've done really good at their work. So only if they've done a good job, do I let them draw out of this jar. And this one says have a dance party. So there'll be different activities in here um, that they write a letter to someone. So um, they really enjoy this. It's funny, these little things uh, get them very excited about school and the end of the day and throughout the day. This is just a little jar with stickers in it. If they do a good job, um, I let them pick out a sticker and put it on their paper. And then these jars, jars are fun. Um, <laughs> these jars have, of course, like markers and pens and pencils, and they make a lot of games with their curriculum. So sometimes we'll save the games and play them again, like the adverb game. And so, yeah, the jars are fun. It's a fun, fun thing to do. Thanks for showing us those jars. They are fun. That's something I think my kids would have a lot of fun with too. So, okay. Now I want you to just tell us what a typical day looks like from the time you guys get up until you're finished with school. Okay. So, um, we usually get up and we do, um, breakfast and about, I used to do this every day, but about 50% of the time, let me get a space to set you down. Um, we'll do a morning jar and um, morning jar typically, or I call it morning basket, sorry. 
And these are some of our morning basket things that we've done in the past is I'll usually have like a prompt and I'll have books set out and we'll do an activity for the morning jar. Robots and geography and what was this one? How to draw a tulip, a lot of art projects. So we'll do that kind of while I'm making breakfast. I'll have it set on the table. And when I do that, the kids will run down to the table like it's Christmas morning and so excited to see what I have laid out for the morning basket. So it just depends on the election morning basket. Read American flag poem, make an American president puppet. <laughs> so, um, so that can be really fun to kind of in the winter when getting up early and doing all the things sometimes seems a little bit harder that can add a little fun to uh, your morning. Okay, so then um, I try to have expectations. I think for my kids, it helps them um, self-motivate and get to where they need to be and get started on time. So usually my expectation is that they have their, you know, teeth brushed and dressed and bed made and um, all those things and in their desk seat at nine in the morning. And then we typically do an hour of math. Uh, first off, we use uh, Saxon Math and Nicole the Math Lady, and that's been great. So we usually do about an hour of math together. Maddie does hers pretty independently. I will kind of help her if she needs help, whereas Everett still needs quite a bit of my hands-on help to do that. And then the next subject we usually do is language arts. Um, we use Moving Beyond the Page, so we do a lot of uh, reading literature and then doing the uh, curriculum that's associated with that, a lot of activities. And um, they're two separate levels. So once again, uh, they're kind of doing the same subject at the same time, but I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between the two. I typically do the reading with Everett for his literature the night before. So that way, when we get to, to language arts, um, we can get right to the assignments versus reading. But if we don't get to the reading at night, we do it during that time. Um, and then um, we'll do spelling, whatever, we'll do spelling. And then um, we'll typically do social studies or science after that. Um, let's see, um, do you have any questions? <laughs> I don't know. So we're in love with your morning basket activities and we want okay. to know, so did you create those by yourself? Is there a place we can go? Is there a curriculum? Tell us. Oh gosh. Um, so I kind of take a lot of ideas from other people and then kind of make it my own. So I, I think Pam Barnhill is the person who wrote a book about it. I've read her book. Um, so I kind of took some of her ideas and then some other ideas off of, I think there's a morning basket Facebook page that I have seen and gotten some ideas. I typically, I actually have a, a list in one of my calendars where every time I get an idea, I just write it down. And so I have this list of ideas. And then often what I'll do is um, when I do my library pickup order is I'll get a whole bunch of books or things about different topics that I'm thinking about doing. And then when they come in, I'll make the basket for that topic. Some topics are one day, some topics are multiple days. It kind of depends on how big the topic is and how much I have to teach them. Um, we'll do morning tea sometimes too. Sometimes I'll have everything all set up for a tea party in the morning and we'll read poetry and eat breakfast. Um, so it's just, it's a way to kind of keep things fun and fresh every day because we do have a lot of routine in our, in our schedule. So it's, I think it's fun to have the morning basket to make it fun and then, but still have that routine and the expectations of what we need to get done during the day as well. Okay, does anybody have questions for Dawn? Cause of course I have questions, but I'm gonna give you guys a chance first if you wanna ask her. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask. So Dawn, I know your kids do music. I know you guys do art. I know you do PE. So tell me how you fit that in because you have a very busy morning. So how do you do all the other things too? Um, so the curriculum that I use art, there's a lot of art integrated into it. So um, the Moving Beyond the Page curriculum that, that I use integrates language arts, um, art, social studies, science all together. So a lot of the assignments will have 
drawing or painting or cooking or going outside and doing this and that. So that way it makes it easy because I feel like we're doing art all the time. But um, morning basket also tends to be um, maybe where we get some more art in there. Um, in the afternoons, it's not uncommon to do art because art's so fun. I mean, that's not a hard thing to fit in. Um, let's see, social, or you said um, science. Science, um, we use the curriculum. We typically will fit that in. If, if that's their main unit is we'll fit it in at, during the morning. We'll actually kind of move from here usually down to the kitchen to do science um, if, if it needs to be like an experiment or whatnot. But um, if it's kind of a side unit, not one of the main units we're doing, we'll usually do it in the afternoon or outside or um, like for example, yesterday we went to the zoo and we're studying animal adaptations. We'll go on a field trip or um, do it that way. Um, PE, Typically, we do the PE jar, but typically after school, so then at noon we have lunch, and then after lunch I do expect them to go outside and play. We have a big yard and lots of things to play with, um, you know, swings and uh, trampolines and, you know, things like that. So uh, they go out for recess, and then we do like ice skating and skiing and um, bicycling and hiking and camping, you know, all the things. So we do those types of things for PE. Um, and then music, we have music lessons once a week and then they practice their music um, in the afternoons and evenings. And so we use, uh, we have a piano teacher that you know, we do once a week piano lessons, but we also use Simply Piano, which is an app for your iPad that if anyone hasn't seen that, it's been really fun to use and it listens to you and you know, helps you learn how to play the piano. And Everett, my son specifically, uh, ever since we got that, his piano, he's, his love for playing piano has just taken off. It's been really fun. That is super fun. I have used Hoffman Academy with my kids um, and it's, it's the same thing. It's an app and he has all of these lessons and we have a real piano teacher too, but I've used that as a supplement and the kids love it. So mm -hmm. yeah. So thanks for sharing. Okay. Any more questions for Dawn before she goes? Okay, Don. thank you so much for sharing you. your life and your home with us. So the last mom we get to meet today is Megan. And Megan, I want you to introduce us to your family and show us your home. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I am apparently a weird tech nerd. So I wanted to introduce myself and show everybody through kind of a PowerPoint slideshow because I want to talk about some of the iterations of our learning space that we've had in the past too. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up. So, um, hi, we're the Schneiders and we have two kiddos. They are in second, second grade and kindergarten right now. And um, I'm excited about talking about our diverse learning spaces and kind of the evolution of them so far. So we started, oops, we started homeschooling in uh, 2020 during the great pandemic shutdown. I was teaching in a public school and my son was in kindergarten, but both my husband and I came from a homeschooling background. So we were excited about eventually making the switch and then surprise, we were doing it right now. So um, it was chaos, but we embraced it. And so our homeschool um, learning space started as just this entertainment center in our living room, which by the way, is teeny tiny. Um, and we got all of our curriculum stashed there, our activities, our manipulatives, and just made it a learning hub. We wanted it low down so that the kids felt like they had a lot of access to it. Um, and it's what worked for the space that we had. And then you can see our main work area was the coffee table that was right next to it, which was always littered with other things and food. <laughs> And our dining table, so this is James doing uh, Cheerio math with, um, with, our, with our dining table. So that was our setup for the rest of that year. It was a really neat start. Um, it was tiny, but it was enough. And uh, it made us excited to continue. So 
then we got to go into doing it on purpose this time. So this was the following fall where we knew actually that we were going to be homeschooling. So we rearranged the kids room. They shared a bunk bed and we re rearranged the kids room so that we could build this little double desk for them. We found out pretty fast how important displaying their work and their crafts and their ideas was. So things are always all over the walls for us, sometimes to a point that brings clutter that bothers mama, but it makes their little hearts happy. So that's what we do. We've got little bins for James and then the other side had Ella's and they had more stuff in their baskets underneath. And then across the top is where we stored um, our teaching supplies. So this was a really great use of the space that we had. It's what we could do with our pretty small home and we crammed everything, including the bunny into here. Um, the one thing that we didn't love about this because with their ages, we wanted to do a lot of collaborative and guided work because it was a desk and built against the wall, there wasn't a lot of face-to-face -face time with instruction. So it worked for the space, but it wasn't ideal for us. Um, however, also wanna say we used every other learning space um, and we used outside a lot. We would go outside, we would try and um, try and, identify any opportunity for learning or for celebrating curiosity. So our walks, our hunting for tadpoles, our um, looking for Narnia, our, all of our explorations we considered part of our learning space and part of our, part of our homeschool experience too. Also, even with designated curated schooling space in their room, this is what the kitchen table looked like. And we ended up doing learning on the floor too, looking at the Revolutionary War through a Lego lens. So just trying to connect with their world and letting schooling go wherever um, it made sense to them and where they were doing the most living. So after that, we moved into the house we currently live in and it had an extra room. So we got to enter into the privilege of having a whole designated school room, which was really exciting. So this is our setup right now. We have, you can see our whole wall full of cork boards that are absolutely overflowing with proudly displayed crafts and activities. We've also got um, a, a digital picture frame over here. So when they have to take stuff down off of the walls, we let them go through it and anything that they still kind of have a little heartbeat for, we take pictures of and just have a constantly scrolling slideshow of their work. So that way they can kind of let go of the physical pieces, but still get to have it displayed, just not in as much bulk. Um, we have all of our not color-coded books over here in the bookshelves. Um, the readers are in these bins and up on the top of the shelf is where we store the um, teacher's curriculum materials. And then because we did not like facing the wall, we have a group work table. And that's where all of the learning happens. They have their individual tubs with their own workbooks that they pull from. And then we built this desk across the end of the room. Our son in particular is very science focused. And so we built what we call the science counter. Um, it now has a pile of stuff on it, including a microscope and a diorama of the moon and all kinds of stuff going on there. And so we wanted to customize the space to match his interests um, and learning style and make what he wanted to learn about relevant um, to the space. So we've got this big, gorgeous uh, school room that they do most of their like formalized school work in, but we still pull learning from everywhere. So my in-laws are right down the road and they keep bees. So sometimes school is, 
in their workshop where they're learning about collecting honey and sometimes learning looks really really muddy in the playhouse and sometimes it looks like learning about animals and learning about chickens and how to take care of them and how to participate in what we're doing in the family so again a lot of connection with nature a lot of inspiration from outdoors whether or not we're doing the actual learning outdoors and even though we have that beautiful table in our schoolroom, we're still using our living room table because that's sometimes where the hub of life is happening. So we bring learning into there as well. It's nice to be able to clean everything up if we want to have company or if we want to have, I don't know, a grown up space sometimes. And because of that, I really like being able to fall back on um, a designated learning space where they always know they can go and get their craft supplies, they can do some schoolwork, they can, um, they can engage in these activities that they really like and it's not going to go away, but also it's great to get to have it brought all over into the rest of the rest of our home. Megan, I love your digital picture frame idea. I'm totally stealing that because I've got a lot of projects I'd like to get rid of. So that's a beautiful way to, yeah, to keep them scrolling. Yeah. Okay. It's really nice. So we let them say like, you can hang up everything that fits in this space or you can keep your 10 top favorites right now and the rest are gonna go in the picture frame so we still get to see them. And it really saves a lot of tears and a lot of wall space. Mm -hmm. I love it. So will you tell us what a day looks like in your homeschooling world from wake up until you finish learning? Sure. So mine is somewhat anecdotal because in our situation, I am mostly working in here. This is my home office and my husband is doing the day-to-day -day homeschooling with the kids, but they are right in here. So the homeschool room is right across and it usually starts with um it usually starts with math so they come in and get math done first and that is looking like they'll come and sit on either side of the table and get kind of a group lesson done or even though they're working on separate materials they'll kind of cover some things in a group and then get james set up to do some things independently while he focuses on um helping ella through her work so it's kind of a tag team them through independently for that we work through math and reading in this room and then science as well but science tends to um move around a lot so it might be on our science counter which is a little more buried than the pictures it might be happening in our science counter, it might be happening outside, it might be happening upstairs by the stove. Uh, so science moves around a lot depending on what kind of hands on activities we're doing and we try and do a lot of hands on activities along with our science and uh, social studies typically actually here you guys are going to see I cleaned up my room too. Um, so school room looking very nice, but keeping it real here. Here's my son's room. And uh, more frequently, that giant beanbag in the corner is where history happens. So that's where history, where some um, larger reading time or read aloud time will happen. They'll pile up in the giant beanbag together. And let's see, what else? Bible time happens in the beanbag. And I don't know what I'm missing. Art typically is in in this room because all of the art supplies are there oh and we also have a little walk-in closet next to next to the school room and it is full of our games and more supplies and more curriculum and that bin down there is just full of manipulatives so I think that's the flow. It starts in this room and it's in this room for the first maybe two hours. And then, then there's outside time every day and they go out for a while, they have lunch for a while. So that's moving them around. 
the space and getting them upstairs and then a couple more activities that might be in here or it might be in the bean bag or it might be upstairs on the couch, especially now that the sun is back. And then we usually finish up around one o'clock along with those breaks. Okay, so I am so thankful you showed us around. That was super fun. Does anybody have a question for Megan? Well, so I have a question. Always, it's always me with the questions. So when you have a room, dedicated school room, and your kids are younger, how do you manage them going into that school room without adults and later in the day? Is it open all the time? Like, can you kind of tell us how you use that room when it's not school? Yeah, it's it's open all the time. Um, it's it is in some ways replacing like a playroom for them. They will build forts in here. This table is a great table to hang blankets around and build a fort in. They have to get it cleaned up by the end of the day so it can be a functional schoolroom the next day. Um, and I've found that that is a really helpful incentive because they may not like it, but they certainly understand it. So that responsibility of taking care of their space is something that they're understanding and participating in and they use the craft counter all the time they go through I don't even know how much paper and they're they're creating and they're celebrating and they're writing and they like I found out that my son was writing a book and he had six chapters of this adventure in space and that's what he did in his spare time when no one else was in here. So yeah, they have access because apparently that's how they're using it. Um, they know not to mess with the books above the um, kind of above the bins and the rest they dig into and they migrate into their beds to read at night and they have to get pulled out and that's all fine because they're using them. Um, they are the science counter has a few off limit pieces like the like the microscope, um, but they they get access to most of this because they are doing a lot of experimenting and learning independently and un, in an unstructured way. Um, so even though we're using a pretty structured curriculum, we try and keep that short in the day because around that curriculum we have a pretty largely unschooling approach that we want to empower them with. Thank you. So my kids are away. So you can hear in the background, it's about to get noisy. Um, but thank you. I just want to say thanks again to Erica and Don and Megan for sharing your homes and sharing your day and sharing your life with us because that I learned so much from all three of you women. Um, and thank you all the rest of you for coming. I would love to do another installment of this. I hope this is the first of many. So if you are watching this or if you are present and you hear my baby screeching in the background, then um, please send me a message if you would like for us to view your homeschooling room or hear your homeschooling day. Because again, I'd like to do this again. I would love to show you my homeschooling space. And um, so yeah, just reach out to me. I'm Katrina. And you can find me on Family Partnerships website. And I just really hope we can do this a whole lot more because I think the more we see each other, the more A, we realize we get ideas, but we also realize like what we're doing is, is pretty amazing. And I can see a lot of commonality between what you three ladies were doing. And um, I don't know, it just brings validity to what I'm doing at my home. Like, yeah, this is, we're doing important stuff here. Like I, don't, I may not have a rocket like Megan, but um, I mean, look at that thing. That's amazing. But I just want you guys to all realize you guys are doing amazing things with your kids. It might be your home. It might be your kitchen table, but oh my goodness, the things that are happening there. So go love your kids, go do amazing things around your table. And let me know if you would like to be part of sharing your home in the future and talk to you later. Bye guys.